NASA's twin Voyager probes, which were launched in 1977, amazed the world with their historic journeys to Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Both probes continue their voyage into interstellar space 45 years later. Researchers, some of whom are more recent than the spacecraft, are currently using Voyager data to unravel mysteries within and beyond our solar system. In many ways, NASA's twin Voyager spacecraft have evolved into time capsules of their age. They contain around 3 million times less memory than contemporary cell phones, transmit data at a rate about 38,000 times slower than a 5G internet connection, and each one has an 8-track tape recorder for data storage. Despite these limitations, the Voyagers are still at the forefront of space exploration. So, what are they doing right now? And what will the Voyager spacecraft encounter next? Let's find out. Two of the most amazing spacecraft ever launched would never have taken flight if the stars hadn't aligned. In this instance, the four largest planets in our solar system were the stars. As a result of this rare coincidence, a spacecraft could gain speed from the gravitational pull of each large planet it passed, as if being pulled along by an invisible rope that suddenly broke, sending the probe flying on its course. However, this planetary alignment only happens once every 176 years. A spaceship would have to be launched by the mid-1970s in order to reach the planet while the lineup was still in effect. Fortunately, NASA created two spacecraft to make the most of this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Within 15 days of each other, Voyager 1 and Voyager 2, identical in every way, were launched in the summer of 1977. They have been operating in space for almost 45 years, sending data back to Earth every day from the solar system's farthest known planets. The Voyager probes have lasted longer and traveled further than any other spacecraft in history. According to our best understanding of the dividing line between the Sun's sphere of influence and the rest of the galaxy, they have entered interstellar space, becoming the first human-made objects to do so. They will continue to hold this distinction for at least a few more decades. This is quite impressive, given that the Voyager missions were initially only intended to last a few years. The Voyager spacecraft's early observations of Jupiter's and Saturn's moon stunned researchers 40 years ago by revealing active volcanoes and icy fields on worlds they had assumed would be as inactive and cratered as our own moon. Voyager 2 was the first spacecraft to pass by Uranus in 1986, and three years later, it flew by Neptune, the only spacecraft to have done so to date. Today, the Voyager probes are still surprising physicists with unexpected discoveries about the unexplored region of space they now inhabit. Located more than 12 billion miles from Earth, they have made groundbreaking observations as pioneering interstellar probes. Their amazing journey, however, is gradually coming to an end. Over the past three years, NASA has been turning off heaters and other non-essential components to stretch the spacecraft's energy reserves as far as possible, estimating that they will remain operational until around 2030. This is a bittersweet moment for the scientists involved in the mission, many of whom have worked on the Voyager project since the beginning. They are now facing the completion of a project that has far exceeded their highest expectations. Voyager 1 arrived at Jupiter 546 days after its launch in March 1979, with Voyager 2 following a different course and arriving in July of the same year. Both spacecraft were designed to be stable platforms, necessary for their VidCon cameras, which used red, green, and blue filters to create full-color images. Since their rotating velocity is more than 15 times slower than the crawl of a clock's hour hand, they barely spin at all, reducing the likelihood of visual blur. The spacecraft began transmitting the first images of Jupiter while still three to four months away from the planet, delighting standing room-only crowds at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, a JPL. One of the most unexpected discoveries was Io, which showed up in vibrant color. Before the Voyager missions, scientists believed all moons in the solar system would appear similar, drab and cratered. The incredible diversity of moonscapes the Voyagers found near Jupiter and Saturn was not predicted. When the Voyagers were still a million miles from Jupiter, one of their instruments, the Low Energy Charge Particle, LECP, detection system, detected some peculiar signals. These signals indicated that Io had active volcanoes, which the Voyager cameras later confirmed. The small moon, slightly larger than Earth's moon, is now understood to be the most volcanically active body in the solar system. 
Its volcanoes eject materials that give Io its colorful hues and create the anomalous ions detected by the instruments. The greatest of Io's volcanoes has produced plumes 30 times higher than Mount Everest, and its ash field is almost the size of France. The Voyager spacecraft captured more than 33,000 images of Jupiter and its satellites in total, with each photograph revealing something new. One of the more surprising discoveries was that Jupiter had rings, and Europa, one of Jupiter's 53 named moons, had an icy covering that appeared shattered, now thought to be more than 60 miles thick. As they left the Jupiter system, the Voyagers received a gravity assist that gave them a farewell boost of 35,700 miles per hour, which allowed them to escape the Sun's gravitational pull and continue on their journeys. After passing Saturn, the two spacecraft split paths. Voyager 1 passed by Titan, the moon cloaked in an orange haze, and then turned north, away from the plane of the planets. Voyager 2 continued to Uranus and Neptune, making it the only spacecraft to visit these planets. In 1986, Voyager 2 discovered 10 new moons orbiting Uranus, and three years later, it observed the fastest wind speeds ever recorded for a planet, up to 1,000 miles per hour, as it passed Neptune. Triton, Neptune's largest moon, was found to be one of the coldest locations in the solar system, with surface temperatures as low as minus 391 degrees Fahrenheit minus 235 degrees Celsius. Ice volcanoes on Triton were observed ejecting nitrogen gas and particles five miles into its thin atmosphere. Carl Sagan, a member of the mission's imaging team, persuaded NASA to capture one last batch of pictures before the cameras were shut off for good. On Valentine's Day in 1990, Voyager 1 pointed its cameras back toward the inner solar system and snapped 60 final photos. One of these, the now famous pale blue dot, shows Earth from a distance of 3.8 billion miles, the farthest image of our planet ever taken. In the photo, Earth appears as a tiny speck, almost invisible, hidden by dim sunlight reflected off the camera's optics. Both voyages are now so far from Earth that a one-way radio signal, traveling at the speed of light, takes almost 22 hours to reach Voyager 1 and just over 18 hours to reach Voyager 2. They advance by three to four light seconds every day. The NASA Deep Space Network, a trio of tracking facilities around the globe, maintains continual communication with the spacecraft, but the signals are growing fainter as the voyagers move farther into space. Despite these faint signals, the voyagers continue to provide astronomers with valuable data as they explore the interstellar region. While the voyagers have entered interstellar space, they have not yet left the solar system entirely. The Oort cloud, a distant collection of comet-like objects held together by the sun's gravity, may extend halfway to the nearest star. It will take another 300 years for the voyagers to reach the Oort cloud's inner edge. However, interstellar space, where the solar wind phenomena end, begins much closer. The solar wind is a continuous outpouring of charged particles and magnetic fields that the sun, like all stars, emits at hypersonic speeds, creating the heliosphere. This magnetic field extends into space, but eventually, it encounters resistance from interstellar matter, forming a boundary known as the heliopause. The distance to this boundary was uncertain before the Voyager missions, but now, thanks to their pioneering exploration, we have a clearer understanding of this transition between our solar system and the rest of the galaxy. According to some of the early assumptions, one early guesstimate located the heliopause as close as Jupiter. Garnet's calculations from 1993 put the distance at around 25 times further, between 116 and 177 astronomical units, AU. 1 AU, or 93 million miles, is the distance between the Earth and the Sun Garnet's projections from 1993 were accurate, before one of the voyagers ultimately reached the heliopause, about 20 years had elapsed. Voyager 1 had actually detected the anticipated rise in plasma density, its plasma wave detector had inferred an 80-fold increase. However, there had been no indication of a shift in the ambient magnetic field's direction. Shouldn't that change have been apparent if the vehicle had traveled from a place where the magnetic field originated from the sun to one where it came from other stars? That was a shocker. In November 2018, Voyager 2 arrived at the interstellar seashore but did not notice any magnetic field changes when the spacecraft reached the heliopause at 120 Australian dollars from Earth, the same distance reached by its twin six years earlier. It added still another riddle, 
all theoretical models predicted that the heliosphere should ebb and flow in time with the sun's 11-year cycle, but this did not fit any of them. The solar wind ebbed and flowed at that time when Voyager 2 arrived, the solar wind was at its strongest, and if the predictions were accurate, the heliopause should have been further out than 120 Australian dollars. The theorists' models of the interaction between the heliosphere and the interstellar environment are getting more intricate now that the Voyagers are providing them with some actual field data. According to the general image, our sun left a hot, ionized zone and entered a patchy, partially ionized section of the galaxy. The hot zone probably developed as a result of a supernova, an ancient star nearby, or perhaps several exploded at the end of their lives, heating the surrounding area and removing electrons from adjacent atoms in the process. One way to conceptualize the boundary enclosing that area is like a seaside, with all the water and the waves whirling and mixing together. Magnetic fields twist and turn because we are in that sort of tumultuous area. Although the degree of turbulence observed can vary depending on the method of observation, it is not like the smooth magnetic fields that theorists typically prefer to draw. As a result of the heliosphere's influence on the interstellar medium, the Voyager data reveal numerous small-scale changes near the heliopause but negligible field variations at vast scales. It is anticipated that the spacecraft will eventually leave those turbulent zones behind and come into contact with a pure interstellar magnetic field. Saying goodbye to these innovative spacecraft won't be simple, seeing things come to an end is difficult. There are currently five operational instruments aboard Voyager 2 and four on Voyager 1. They are all propelled by a mechanism that transforms heat from plutonium's radioactive disintegration into electricity. However, NASA has been forced into triage mode as a result of the power output diminishing by roughly 4 watts annually. The Voyager's adventures will continue even when they are entirely silenced. Voyager 1 will pass Proxima Centauri, our closest neighboring star, in 16,700 years. Voyager 2 will follow 3,600 years later. After that, they will spend millions of years orbiting the galaxy long after our sun has disintegrated and the heliosphere has vanished, not to mention one pale blue dot. They will still be there, largely undamaged. They might be able to deliver a final message at some point throughout their journey, however, it won't be broadcast over the radio. If it is, it won't be by humans. Two recordings, another form of antiquated technology, are used to convey the message. But these are not your typical plastic versions, these are formed of copper, have a gold coating, and are enclosed in aluminum. Images and sounds intended to provide a feeling of the world the voyagers came from are encoded in the grooves of the golden records, as they are known. There are 90 minutes of music, including Bach's Brandenburg Concerto No. 2 and Chuck Berry's Johnny Be Good, as well as images of kids, dolphins, dancers, sunsets, and sounds of crickets, rain, and a mother kissing her child. Jimmy Carter, who was President of the United States at the time the Voyagers were launched, also left a message, we cast this message into the cosmos. It reads, in part, we hope someday, having solved the problems we face, to join a community of galactic civilizations. This record represents our hope, determination, and goodwill in a vast and awesome universe. Thanks for watching another episode. While you're still here, make sure to click the video on your screen for more mind-blowing videos.